Um, we have uh, the distinct pleasure of welcoming back uh, one of the U of M alumni, uh, Dr. Wenbo Wang, who obtained his PhD in Dr. Pellowell's group um, in biosystems engineering. So I think that was before there was a biomedical engineering program. Um, Although, yeah, yeah, we're, we're glad to have him back. Um, and so basically, as a graduate student, I understand he developed uh, hybrid spectroscopy techniques uh, to probe, uh, probe molecular information about biological materials. Um, and then after completing his graduate work, uh, he moved on to Vancouver, uh, where he undertook uh, postdoctoral training at the BC Cancer Research Agency and um, has been working there in the Oncology and Imaging Unit. And currently, he's a member of the Photomedicine Group uh, within the Department of Dermatology and Skin Sciences at UBC um, in the laboratories of Dr. Zhang and Liu. And he's going to tell us today about some of his current research, um, which has continued on with the applications of optical spectroscopy and laser scanning microscopy um, to study cancer and, and skin structure. So we look forward to your talk. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your kind introduction. And thank you for having me here to present the talk about my research at the Cancer Research Center and the University of British Columbia. Uh, basically, our research is primarily focused on uh, using optical measures to understand the optical properties of tissues and biological fluids uh, so that they can mainly focused on developing spectroscopy and imaging technologies uh, for us to detect and delineate and treat pre-invasive uh, pre cancers uh, at early stage. And uh, also our program is uh, mainly interested in translating all these technologies into clinical usable tools that can be used directly to improve the care of the cancer patients. Uh, so, to begin with, I'm gonna uh, briefly go through some of the fundamentals about uh, light and light tissue interactions, and then uh, talk a little bit about the cancer, and uh, and, and then we'll go ahead and talk about how biophotonic research will be able to address some of the challenges and the problems that we have that uh, exist in the diagnostic uh, modality that we're not able to address. And uh, then uh, our program, uh, our group, mainly focus on uh, developing the like, uh, raw spectroscopy-based technologies for early cancer detection. So there have been uh, quite a few clinical field-based studies that we have already completed, and then we're going to talk about that. And then uh, we are also, like our group is a part of uh, the Photomedicine Institute group within the Department of Dermatology and Skin Sciences at the University of British Columbia. So then uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the skin, the skin anatomy and the skin uh, uh, problem that we commonly see and how we can use uh, microscopic imaging technology to help us better understand skin in a uh, non-invasive way. Um, then I'll be able to uh, wrap up today's talk with uh, uh, some of the interest videos we were able to acquire using our enable microscopy imaging system. And so a little bit back for information about the place that we are watch. It's uh, a BC Cancer Research Center. It's a, like a, you can see, it's a very a unique building, and then it's it's a, like, like a landmark building as a along the Vancouver Islands, and you can easily distinguish it by looking at the, this like, big raw windows. So it's, and it's a, a home to about 97 principal PIs, 450 technical staff, and around 320 uh, research trainees. And the department I am working in is called the Integrative Oncology Imaging Unit. We have three, uh, sorry, seven principal PIs, and we have uh, about 40 technical staff members. And the PIs work on a wide range of um, uh, optical-based technologies to 
from fluorescence in microcellular engines to uh, optical coating radiography and the use of the NAS therapies. And so, okay, so let's uh, just uh, go ahead and talk about light. So, uh, as we all know from uh, Maxwell equations, that the light is actually a electromagnetic radiation, so the change in uh, electrical components of the uh, field cause like a, a change in uh, electromagnetic field and then to, to change in magnetic field to cause uh, changing electrical and go on force and then uh, create the uh, propagation of, of an energy along the traveling direction. And then we combine all this uh, equation together, you'll be able to derive an equation that describes the traveling uh, wave. And so, light can be explained by mostly by the, the wave theory. And you can see here lots of uh, phenomena that you observe, like refractance, refraction, interference, refractions. And for this, they can all be explained by using the wave theory itself. For example, if you put a barrier in front of the light source, you'll be able to see the, the light will be able to propagate uh, behind the barrier itself. So that can be explained by the diffraction theory. Uh, but there's only one phenomenon we can't explain using the wave uh, theory, that's it, the fully electric uh, effect where we hit the piece of metal with, with light and then we will be able to generate electrons. So that can only be explained by the, the particle theory of the light. And since uh, the electromagnetic uh, uh, wave can be characterized by a number of uh, parameters, such as the wavelengths and the frequencies, so we'd like to like, artificially divide this, the electromagnetic spectra into uh, different regions uh, so that we can utilize them better. So for example, the visual regions which we often perceive our naked eye is consist of a very tiny portion of the entire electromagnetic spectra so from from four hundred to seven hundred nanometers uh, in wavelengths. And uh, in the longer wavelength region in the near infrared we have this interesting uh, radiations that we can use to they can study the vibrational energies within the molecules. And so that's basically uh, how we be able to capture light. And uh, so for most of the light we use in bar photon research, we use all the lights from uh, 300 <coughs> nanometers to 900 nanometers. So uh, if you talk about uh, photomedicine and the uh, photo chemistry and for the biology we're gonna have uh, keep coming back to this diagnostic diagram to explain how what sense really happens uh, in terms of energy of the electrons. But you can see here all the vertical axis represent the energies and uh, the solid lines here, the bulk uh, I'm sorry, uh, the bulk line here is represent the limits of the electron energy state. And uh, for each electron energy state, there are a couple of uh, like a vibronic energy state uh, uh, associated with them. So um, whenever we shine a, a, a beam of light onto matters, so there are going to be an energy exchange. If the, the energy is sufficient, like um, is powerful enough in terms of the, the photon energies, uh, we will be able to excite the electrons to promote them into a excited state. And, uh, and between the first excited state and the ground state, there's only there are competing like uh, um, uh, energy degradation processes, like uh, internal uh, conversions, uh, or like the vibrational relaxations. And uh, but the, the most the, one of the important process is the fluorescent, as you can see here on the left on here. And uh, also, of course, there are some other processes that are going on. We have the correct amount of energy kind of excited photons. So for example, uh, the IR absorption in the near infrared and the near infrared. And also, one of the most important but is very well phenomena is uh, what we call the Raman scattering. It's an elastic scattering process where the light can 
uh, we, we use exciting advice to, to like, promote uh, the electron to a virtual energy state over here. And then um, all this exciting photon on the hand will go through a couple of processes, like uh, most of the photons will uh, go back to virtually through the really scattered process. And uh, your very tiny portion, like uh, about one in ten million of the incident in photons will go through a, a process we call it uh, run scattering. And uh, Essentially, there there will be a, a, a energy loss of the photons in here, that which corresponds to the vibrational energy state uh, of the molecules of interest. And also, there even rare is uh, the, the process of uh, what we call anti-stoke around scattering, and where uh, the the electrons are already in an excited vibrational state, and then they excite and they go to virtual state and come back to ground state. Actually, so the, the, the active energy to the whole process. So, but that's even rare. Um, so, why we want to like to study uh, human uh, is because, uh, like, molecularly speaking, most of our human bodies are composed of uh, uh, many water, about seven percent of our human bodies the water, and then for those probably we have the, the, the half of, almost half of them are protein, then the fat, and then the rest of them are mineral, all of that. And uh, so, so when we shine a beam of light onto a, a tissue samples, and uh, there are going to be a couple of processes that are going to happen. For example, the most uh, of the, the incident photons will be uh, spectrally reflected due to a, a mismatch in the refracting index between the interface of air and the, your skin surface. And uh, for those photons that go into the tissues, uh, they can be either blocked due according to their wavelengths by proteins, uh, DNA, melanin, or uh, in the visible region, they can be absorbed by hemoglobins or melanins. And uh, they can also be inelastically scattered due to the uh, uh, difference in the refractive indexes and also by the cell membranes and nucleus and proteins. And uh, also, uh, the, it can go through the Raman processes where the proteins and the lipids and DNA are uh, Raman active scatterers. And uh, it also uh, can go through the fluorescent process that, uh, by lots of endogenous fluorophores such as. Tryptophans, proteins, and collagen elastin, and uh, like, uh, also this like, uh, important uh, like, uh, enzyme cofactor called NADH. So, uh, so why do you want to use biophotonics? Uh, so, there are a couple of things that we can use biophotonics to work for a long term. Uh, one is that we can use biophotonics to understand the details on the molecular level of the uh, just uh, take uh, no other modality that will be allow us to do that on a molecular level. And it can, because it's not emissive, we can do it in real time in vivo. We can do a, a early recognition of different stable states uh, without like, uh, damaging the tissues or causing scarring, things like that. And uh, of course, we can use biophoton techniques to. to Delivers like target treatment. For example, we found the lesion site, and we we know it's, it's cancer, and we can deliver this um, certain the chemicals that are, are fully active, and then we can put the fiber to the site, and then just kill the cancer cells, and then keep all the normal tissues healthy. Um, so some of the advantages of uh, biophotonic techniques are like the, the like. The, First and foremost, it's, it's non-invasive. So uh, we we can do the imaging, we can do spectroscopy. We don't really have to damage the samples. Uh, like uh, this is particularly advantageous if you want to monitor the states of your, your patients. And uh, also, we can study and characterize the different diseases in its natural environment. And that means that because our bodies have so many different molecules, by molecules they are it's you know, like acting like, like a natural biomarkers. We don't really have to induce that different like endogenous uh, biomarkers to to tag all these different uh, diseases to be able to tell whether it's a, 
it's, it's, it's like a malignant or oh, normal or benign or something like that. And, uh, and it's really fast and it's really, uh, so we, we can do that in real time. So uh, we can couple that with uh, therapies to do direct our uh, treatment and then we can monitor the dosage of our liver like a light intensity or and to be able to control the, the amount of uh, uh, treatment uh, effect that we want to achieve. And also it, 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 it has less like physiological impact on the patient themselves because like, if you subject patients to go through their diagnosis, you don't want to stretch out your patient too much. Like, uh, because most of the time, the patient actually turned out to be fine. No, it's just the doctors had to be cautious about that, and then they don't want to misstand up the, the suspected lesions. Okay, so now um, I'd like to talk a little bit about cancer. Uh, first, we, we can look at some of the statistics of cancers. Like, uh, as we know, like about two in every five Canadians <coughs> will eventually develop cancer during their lifetime. And uh, one in four of us will gonna eventually die of cancer, well, unfortunately. And uh, there, last year, there were about like, uh, 80,000 people die of cancer, and uh, there were 200,000 people were newly diagnosed with cancer. And uh, there are also like, 800,000 people are currently living with cancer for five years and longer. And if you look at the pie diagram on, on the right, there, the cancer has been the major uh, cause of death. Uh, so it's coming for like a, almost a third of all, all deaths that, that's uh, from natural deaths, uh, followed by heart disease. So there's there have has uh, is a meaning that we have to study cancer and not see how we can combat the cancer. So what has caused cancer? And uh, there's many causes, like this, some of the time it's mainly because some of the chemicals that we are in contact with are carcinogenetic. And uh, also there might be a infected with virus, bacteria, and that the can cause mutation their genes that eventually lead to a cancer. And also radiation is also a big factor uh, that cancer could act. And, um, and also there are other things that come into play when you talk about cancer, like hereditary, whether your family has a history of cancer, and your own diet, your, your home level, so that they, they, they all have an effect on how, when and how you're going to have cancer. So when you talk about cancer, and we, we you think like, oh, how are we going to be able to effectively like, treat cancer or diagnose cancer? And, like, the, the thing, most important thing in, in cancer is that we're going to have to be able to detect them early. Uh, as you can see in this uh, plot here, uh, this is for colorectal cancer. And uh, some statistics here. Okay, so it's if the patients are diagnosed with stage one colorectal cancer, uh, the blue line over here, uh, if you look at the five years survival rate, it's pretty good, around like 87 to 92 uh, percent. So most of the people who are caught cancer early, they will be able to survive. But if you are unfortunately you're diagnosed with cancer at a later stage, much later stage, at like stage four where all your cancer already metastasized, they go into all your different part of your body. And they learn about 11% of survival rate at five years. So there's a, so you can, as you can see, there's a huge difference. And uh, we have to find a way to be able to detect cancer early. So we, when we think about cancer and tumor, and then, then we kind of have to say, well, what, what kind of, uh, like, uh, uh, abnormal growth, we, we have to call it cancer. So there's a couple of things that we will be able to tell whether it's cancer or not. Like, firstly, cancer itself, we, we have such sufficient in growth signals, and uh, if they're sensitive they're any growth signal, so they just keep multiplying itself again, like, again and again without stopping. And uh, they can evolve, like, program cancer cells, the, 
program cell death, and they just uh, also because cancer they have to grow and grow and they need lots of nutrients and oxygen, so they have to grow all this the blood vessels around this the, the tumor itself. And uh, the last thing that uh, cancer it, it can repeat into other regions of your organs uh, and metastasize. So um, right now uh, in in a, in a clinic, if you uh, if any of the patients uh, really they are suspected of having cancer, they you're gonna have to have all or some of the, the, the symptoms. Uh, as for for example, they gonna have the lump and they gonna have to feel the pain and they either have different fever and then they're constantly feeling uh, very tired or they're gonna sudden like a weight gain or loss and then they have an altered metabolism, for example, in colorectal cancer. You have a change in your bowel movement habits, they're gonna, or you have the blood in your stool, so there are definitely some signs that you need to seek medical attention. And for those inaccessible type of cancers, uh, we have uh, some modalities we able to assess where the tumors are and the, 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 the see how big they are, and then we use this technology such as X-ray or CCT or MRI, but the real gold standard measure is like a through surgical biopsy and the pathological diagnosis by uh, taking a physical biopsy of the tumor tissues and then we put them into slides and then have the pathologist examine them under a microscope. So, uh, if you look at the, the top uh, graphs, and it's pretty evident to you, it's like a, there is a big difference between normal and dysplasia and carcinoma in situ and the carcinoma itself is where uh, all the tumor cells have already spread into the other part of the whole body. Uh, but in the reality, you, if you look at all the HD and stain slides, there, uh, there are often seen by the pathologist that you can see. Uh, other than the normal tissue and the, the, the cancer tissue, there were this, there are two significant differences to our, our own trend uh, eyes. Uh, there the differences in, in anything in between them are um, not that significant. And the, 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 that's why it does require many years of treatments uh, for pathologists to be, be able to tell the differences in between all these different uh, disease states. So they, so they, they artificially like generate this uh, the grading system. To, like for example, this is a uh, Gaussian pass, pattern in the scale for prostate cancers. That where they can grade the different tissue according to pathology states from one to five, and uh, so one being the, the normal. The, 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 uh, this differentiated, uh, well done, sorry, it's well differentiated. And uh, so, uh, if you look at all these uh, slide images and uh, you, you tell yourself, like, uh, you know, uh, it's can, kind of, you know, I are relying on just the uh, making decisions based on one single piece of information that's the morphology of the cells. And uh, the, we have, have to also realize that. There's a, like a huge like, uh, differences in uh, intertumor and intratumor evolution of, of the cells uh, of the of the tumor itself, and so uh, it, it's kind of uh, just difficult because the tumor is so heterogeneous. You you can't just uh, make your uh, like a, a prognosis a diagnosis just based on uh, this information. So what we think is, uh, is what we, we, we think in terms of like uh, molecular uh, biology and uh, biochemistry is like right? we want to put things down to molecular levels. Like this, uh, before any the tumors that grow in, inside bodies, so that there are gonna be some changes that in biochemically, so inside the, the stroma of the tissues itself. So if we be able to tell uh, if there's any biochemical changes that are induced 
uh, to the growth of, of cancer, will be able to catch cancer early. So that's the whole idea behind the using Raman spectroscopy for early cancer diagnosis. Uh, so what we developed uh, at BC Cancer Research Center is that we have this uh, patented like uh, rapid Raman uh, spectroscopy uh, uh, analysis system. Um, so we use an uh, yeah, infrared laser light uh, at 75 nanometers. And we are using, we employ a dual state like here and here, a dual state like uh, of the filtering mechanism to be able to filter all the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, light that are not pertinent to the tissue itself. So we also have a patent like uh, of, of fiber optical coupling uh, Technology that uh, we be able to in increase our signal to noise ratio by 60 percent, and by using this is like a parabolic arc that can be coupled to the spectrograph to the ancient sleep, or be able to do that uh, in a hardware instead of using software bands to be able to improve the signal to noise ratios of the Raman. Is or we, we, we had just mentioned Raman is very big signal. So, using our rapid Raman spectroscopy technology, we will be able to detect several type of cancer. Um, so here I'm going to briefly discuss some, some of the successful applications that we have been uh, published in the past. Firstly, the skin cancer uh, is essentially melanoma, and uh, also lung cancer, and as well as colorectal cancer. So these are three major type of cancers. Uh, so melanoma, and uh, so lots of people actually get melanomas. Uh, uh, like it's really, it's actually like one in third, one in every three people uh, in Australia and the states they, they get melanomas, and it's mainly some some of the reasons that because they like people like to go and like, have some. Uh, Older and so have their skin tan, so that's the big risk factors. And when you go go to a, a, a dermatologist clinic, they gonna be able to assess the pigment lesions based on the five criteria, like here, asymmetry, which we call like A, B, C, D, E. Like B is bolder, whether bolder is red, is even or not, and C is whether there can be two or more colors inside the lesion itself, and the um, D is like diameter, is whether the diameter is like a larger than a quarter of an inch, and E is like evolving, whether the origin is like growing over time, and that's how they gonna be able to uh, detect the suspected lesion. And you, when they detect the, the signal, there there's a chance that it's gonna be melanoma. What they do is like, do a oh, like a physical biopsy. Well, they use this like a belt to see punch and then get a punch right into the skin from the epidermal to the dermal and then lead to, to the subcutaneous layers. And then you're not going to go through the entire pathologic examination again. <coughs> but the unfortunate fact here I need to point out that the only 2 to 5% of biopsies were later confirmed to be melanoma. That means you're going to Unnecessarily gonna kind of scar your skins uh, like not, like or ninety percent of the time you just, you have suspected lesion that they're supposed to be in melanoma but they turn out not and uh, so it's it's, it's gonna be fine if the lesions are in some body sites but they, what they have in the, if they're gonna have in the on your or in the client face or somewhere more visible well, you definitely don't want to do that. The other factors here is that uh, the biopsy is really costly, and it's uh, it's around like uh, three hundred dollars per biopsy, and if you get to that, and then it's 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 really gonna cost like billions of dollars just to do on these unnecessary critical uh, biopsies, and it's had a very emotional impact on the patient as well. So um, then. Uh, our group have, were able to develop this rapid, uh, like the Raman spectroscopic technology, 
and which has already been commercialized. And as you can see here, this is the, the end product of the, the rapid robin spectroscopy technology, which we call the, the, the very same aura system. And it has already been commercialized and available in Canada and in Europe. And it's going to the US market as well. And essentially, this system is one of the advantages that is really fast. It only takes one second to be able to tell you whether the lesion is malignant or not with a, with a post-occur probability. Um, as you can see here, this is one of our TIs of the Howard Louis, the dermatologist is trying to assess the lesions on the patient over here. Just by click a button, you will be able to see uh, whether or not the suspect lesions uh, is melanoma or not. So this is a published study uh, based on uh, over a thousand uh, skin lesions that we biopsied and uh, we'll be able to, uh, to do at the, at the UBC dermatology department and skin cancer, uh, skin care center. Mm -hmm. So basically what we uh, were looking at is the cancer versus the treatment lesions such as uh, Actinal keratosis and also melanoma is a lesion lesions and the melanoma this is a subarctic keratosis and uh, uh, so the the bottom cross are uh, this the, the visceral operator curves uh, which is uh, used to assess the performance of your diagnostic test so uh, the ideal the test of course is it's like a Right, go up to the, to the upper left corner and then, and then close it here. But uh, also, we have this number, this we call it the area of the curve. So, the bigger the number, the better the diagnostic test. Mm -hmm. okay. So, these are the summaries of the, the test in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Uh, the sensitivity is a of a diagnostic test and basically tells you how many of the two uh, cancers we are able to detect with our technology and the specificity is it tells you how many of these uh, tests or uh, lesions are confirmed to be uh, benign or, or normal or actually turn out to be benign or normal so both numbers have to uh, need to be uh, Larger possible, but depending on the purpose of your applications, well, you're gonna have to make a compromise between the two numbers because they can just be uh, mandatory rate. And uh, so, so for for melanoma, we uh, you know melanoma is proof of positive So, so we have to have a higher sensitivity so that we can be able to catch most of the the melanoma cancer. So. Uh, 90 percent, uh, and then like a uh, percent that comes in the interval with a 90 percent sensitivity, so we'll be able to achieve uh, 65 uh, percent specificity for skin cancer with uh, actinal keratosis and the benign issues. Um, also, this, then this compares favorably with the uh, uh, diagnostic test, test performed by. Uh, Spectres, dermatologists, and uh, this is like the uh, clinical trainees, and uh, generalists, such as your family doctors. And they, indeed, uh, if you look at the, the top panel here, if we set the sensitivity level at 99%, uh, we can achieve a specificity of 70%. And for an expert, they will only be able to achieve a specificity around the point like uh, three percent. So a point zero three percent. So still the, this technology is comparably more accurate than in, in most cases. Then um, uh, this is a Another application of our technology is that we use that for detecting peripheral lung cancers. And this 
uh, basically the, the spectroscopy itself were, were meant to very pretty much similar. The, the difference that we have to create is the uh, uh, endoscopic aroma catheters that go down the, the instrument channel for a uh, bronchoscope. And it, it had to be very small, you can see here. It has around, had a diameter around 1.8 uh, millimeters. Mm. So the problem with the peripheral lung cancer is that, uh, uh, I can show you a video here. Maybe there are some other ways we can go around this. 
And there is some research recently, and they have been looking at a, a technology what we call like a bio, like a fluid biopsy, where it's just a it's just a blood draw, but the thing that uh, we be looking at different cells inside the blood. For example, uh, there are so many different biomarkers that they're released by both the normal cells and the inflammatory cells and the cancer cell itself. There's DNA segments, RNAs, or proteins. They are all coming into the bloodstream because uh, the cell, the, the two, both tumor cell and the normal cell, they need the nutrients that they have to grow. Um, so if you look at the molecular biology, biology basis for all this, is that uh, DNA essentially they contain the, the protein of our body and then, uh, all the information that are encoded in the DNA is, and then the, 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 the RNAs, the messenger RNAs, have to transcribe all the information from the DNAs and it goes out of the nucleus and then uh, we be able to produce all the, the, the proteins that we need in the ribosome. And which we call the translation. So during the entire process, uh, we have like a three billions uh, base pairs in DNAs, and uh, during each uh, cell division, there's a chance in one or two of these pairs is gonna be not able to be able to replicate it correctly. So there's a chance there's gonna be a mutation in there. Uh, you think it's, it's not that big, like one in three minutes, but what if this mutation there happened in specific gene segments where you have this oncogene or gene inhibitors and you turn off the you turn on the oncogene, you turn off the gene inhibitors, you're gonna get cancer. So beyond beyond gene information you also have the epigenetics. So there are also lots of things involved in here like for example histine uh, modification very essentially uh, they're gonna affect the transcription of the information to a messing RNAs and then also, the DNA methylation, they will be able to assign its genes in a way and in one way or another. And also, we have all these non protein microRNAs, and uh, they will be able to uh, affect the, 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 the translation of the, 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 method, the RNA information into proteins. And all this play the effect on how cancer interacting involves. Um, but as you can see, uh, most of the cells in some of our bodies are healthy, so the, the cancer cell might like, consider a very tiny part, and so are their biomarkers, like the DNA, RNA, and the protein. So, how are we going to be able to find all these um, tiny, very tiny, tiny portions of this mutated gene information? It's so just like finding a, a, a needle in a haystack, right? Uh, so we really need a very high safety uh, detection technology that we brought in a, a technology we call surface enhanced, a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Essentially, we brought all the biomolecules uh, close together uh, in proximity to two layers of non particles, uh, where we can use plus and non plus to make an effect and be able to enhance the Raman signal by like a 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11th uh, uh, time. So we'll be able to achieve a detection limit uh, at a single molecule level. So this is the study uh, I done with one of uh, our postdocs uh, in our lab. So essentially we, what we do is that we collect blood samples from a, a, a group of patients uh, uh, with both normal and uh, cancer and the pulse uh, have, have been confirmed clinically by a, a gastroenterologist. And we, so we prepare all these non particles and then we do the search measurements and we'll be able to uh, identify all these uh, Raman peaks that are correlated with the biomolecules that can relate back to the biomarkers of, of the cancer, potential in cancer and uh, uh, kinds of precursor lesion. Um, so this is the result. Like uh, uh, the, this is the RC curve uh, achieved in our test. And uh, for here, this is the detection uh, specifically achieved using the fit test uh, by the for, for the colorectal cancer. Uh, like you can see here, there's overlap. So 
uh, our test is comparable in performance to the FRT, FRT test uh, for detecting color cancer. But the, the real beauty of the technology is that we be able to have a higher uh, the accuracy in detecting adenoma, which are the precursors to, to the to the color cancer. This is this is very important in terms of uh, early cancer detection. Okay, I'll uh, play enough for cancer research. So uh, I just go briefly through some of the uh, work we have done uh, with the dermatology department. Uh, so th this is the, the human skin, and uh, we know that it's the largest organ uh, in general. It covers like two meters, square meters on average. So it, it's the thinnest uh, on your feet, and the, the, the thinnest on uh, your eyelid. So every 28 days, you're going to shed your own skin and you have new skin, new skin. So this. And then if, if you look at our skin in you know, a microscopic scale, we're going to see uh, we have different layers. So first is the epidermis, the dermis, and uh, the subcutaneous fat. And so the, if you look even closer at the, the epidermis fat, so we have, again, have not so many layers, like the stratagonia, which is the utmost this layer, um, uh, which will help all the cells that help to get the severe lipids. And we have this uh, strata marinosum, where all the, the keratin center uh, exists, uh, where the grow uh, the keratin and push it upwards and, and then grow into a stratagonia layer. And then we we'll also have this the, the, the stratum basal here, where is where you have all the basal cell and the, the, the melanocyte in here, where the melanocyte will be able to generate all, all the, all the melanins that, that, that uh, eventually turn out to be our complexion of our skin. So there are some common like, skin conditions that we can often see inside a laboratory clinic. For example, the one on the left, it's, it's all called a bit light over. So it's a it's the it's a lot of colors and the blotches of your skin. Mm. The the reason for, for this to happen is that we uh, have some dead or dysfunction in the melanocyte inside of our skin that uh, no longer produce melanin. Um, and this one on, on the right and uh, that's the custom condition of we call psoriasis. Versus the autoimmune disease, where the, 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 the skin can skin cells will the, just the grow like ten times faster than normal skins, and then we produce this red place with white scales on top of it. So these are very interesting like, the dermatologic conditions. Uh, they, are, they have been continually continuous study uh, in skin research, and also we have all these different uh, pigment lesions of the dermoscope uh, as I just uh, have talked about like the visual cell carcinoma, the melanomas and uh, all different um, skin uh, pigment lesions. So sorry, and, uh, the technology that uh, we developed is uh, one of them is called topical microscopy. Uh, in there and why is this uh, we use like my comparable microscopy uh, is most of the time they mean inside his powerful facility that we be using just quite a few uh, one line energy. Uh, the, the, the advantage of comparable microscopy is that it allows us uh, to be able to do an awful section of the skin or the tissues so that they have a better uh, workflow uh, spatial resolution. Uh, and it, it, so We'll be able to do uh, different layers, and we also, for it's a, like for for resistance microscopy, we'll be able to uh, have less difference from adjacent layers, so we have a, a, a much better uh, image in quality. And also, what what we have developed is a, a multiple imaging technology that can be combined into our comfortable microscopy uh, uh, system. Uh, as you can see here, this is uh, 
a single photon excitation where we have using this uh, 488 nanometer excitation like the this is the slower for inside the <coughs> and then along the optical path you gotta be able to excite all the photons. but that's uh, not very impressive in terms of image quality. But if you're using the two photon excitation where the two photon sensors are combined, like longer and longer resonances you combine to generate the same rate effect of a single photon excitation, you'll be able to have very localized like, excitation like here. That all of the sensors along with optical path are going to be excited because uh, for two photon exciting to happen, you're going to have the highest threshold of temporal coherence. So this is the the simultaneous uh, comfortable and one photon microscopy system we have the back to the lab. Um, essentially, we have a firm second laser. Uh, it's used for micro imaging, and uh, uh, this is a uh, reflect comfortable. That's uh, uh, the for, for getting the comfortable image. And then we have all this uh, two photon uh, fluorescence detector and the second harmonic generation detectors we can be put to, put, sorry, placed close together and, and in, we don't really have to pinhole because and we just saw that the uh, localized excitation we don't really have to do uh, pinhole so we can be placed close together uh, to the microscope object itself and uh, we have it's, the unique, uh, one of the features we have is that we have a eight kilohertz like a resonance scanner, which can be able to uh, to generate the real time images and do the reviews at the same time. So uh, this is the frame rate we need to achieve at uh, this uh, 256 by uh, 256 pixel uh, spatial resolution. So this is what we have been able to see with our uh, in-house uh, continuous comfortable and uh, multi-photon imaging system. Uh, the first image is a uh, uh, reflex comfortable. Uh, you can see all the cell boundaries in here. This is due to the refracting this the mismatch between the cell membranes. And uh, also the two photo uh, fluorescence you can see here. They are, they are mainly generated in the center plasma. So and if we, if we put them together, we have a code register, and then we have this uh, false color images where you can see nicely all the different, uh, all the like, skin cells here nicely layered together. Mm -hmm. And you can see all, also the nucleus, and these are the, uh, the dark spots inside of each of the cytoplasm. And uh, based on our system, we are also uh, successfully developed a uh, micro environment uh, imaging system. This the difference that we were not only be able to do the imagery, we will be also be able to uh, do a form of scanning around uh, and uh, technology. Uh, so to acquire the, the RAM spectrum of all these uh, different uh, features. So this is a like a, a, a neuroma. Uh, so it's a very common like a skin condition, and uh, that you can essentially see all the blood because it's red. So you will be able to detect the blood. And uh, uh, this is pretty cool here at one thousand one hundred twenty-five is like the big numbers. This is correlated to the glucose inside your um, blood. So so. This instrument can be used to like, monitor your blood glucose levels without having to punch your fingers each and every time. We don't have time for that. Um, <coughs> just so a very quick view for you and divide things. Smaller. That's because we are uh, going from the stratocomia to the uh, granulosome where the, the 
the cells that become the wrong, the wrong enemies. Here you can see all these bright spots here. These are the melanocytes, where because melanin is a very strong uh, scattering. So there's a summary in my talk. So the biophotonic technique will provide an alternative solutions to some of the existing healthcare problems. And the optical spectroscopic techniques uh, offers a quantitative and a quantitative biochemical information for all tissue and biophotonic invasion. And the real-time involvement spectroscopy offers early cancer diagnosis with sensitivity and specificity and good or even better than the most clinical assessment by our specialists and our model microscopy imaging technique providing morphological information about its chemical specificity of skins in very one in real time. With okay, well, that, I conclude my today's talk and thank you very much for your time. All right, we have maybe just a couple minutes for questions, if anybody has, has a question for Dr. Wang. So when you do all of the random imaging, how do you select the wavelengths that are going to be, or the bands that are going to be diagnostic? Is there any chemical diagnosis behind it, or is this purely statistical? Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, you're talking about the excitation wavelengths or the wavelengths? No, 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 the random spectra that you get from the scattering. Oh, uh, the random spectra? Uh, yeah, that's uh, because where we got the, the tissue itself is so uh, complicated that uh, we can only tell also whether all this band is related to certain biochemical bonds, and if we cannot specifically say that which of these random peaks are related to our certain molecules. Uh, so and then. So how do you make your diagnosis? Is it purely empirical? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not part of it. And because of essentially what we do is just there, there's strong spectra that we put in a, in a, like a chemometric methods and like a, do a pattern recognition later on. So we just run a principal component analysis to, to just uh, uh, reduce the dimensionality of the spectra itself and. Then, we pick out all these prominent like, uh, principal components of data that uh, contain most of the variations, and then we use that to fit into the, either a linear classifier or uh, just a generic uh, like, like discriminant analysis classifier, then we do go from there. So oh. you're doing DCA and, and LD, but do you, once you get those out, do you not have any idea what it is that you're looking? Typically, when people are using RAM, they're just looking for cell proliferation, right? So you're looking for nucleic acids. This is it's fairly common in these applications. Yeah, sorry. It's just a, um, we are more like interested in right at this stage is like a more like a black box cancer. Uh, yeah, very good. Raman goes in and we have two different stages. Magic comes out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, one more, one more question. Uh, I have a question about this, uh, the rapid ramen. Uh, that was a uh, pretty interesting device. Uh, I want to know uh, how sensitive uh, is this device to the skin tone? So the skin tone, skin color. Oh, Sorry? The, to the complexion of the skin? Yeah. Uh, how sensitive? Uh, like, is there any uh, ranges uh, of the skin colors that can use that device, or it works on uh, every skin? Um, for example, the, the, the application of the device for detecting skin cancers, yes. that's what for the differentiating between white mass versus pigmentation lesions. So, and lesions that have color in it, we are suspected to be possible melanoma. We we use that as the the other group compared with melanoma. And the normal skins uh, we don't have it. And so I guess that doesn't really come into play when we're trying to detect the 